It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 304 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 22nd of July 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Lucas Randall. Hey Ed. And a geneticist from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, Dr. Carolyn DeGraff. Welcome back. Hey Ed, great to be back. And a quick reminder to everyone, you can be a part of making this show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate to support us on Patreon. And today we're going to be talking about the new moons discovered around Jupiter the diseases you can catch down a cave, and why bats always seem to be the culprits, and a new blood test for melanomas. But okay, we're going to talk about probably one of the biggest stories of the last few weeks, I think. The thrilling rescue of all 12 Thai kids and their soccer coach from the flooded cave in Thailand. It was an extraordinary challenge and a credit to the thousands of people involved. And our hearts especially go out to the family of Saman Kunan, the 38-year-old former Thai Navy SEAL who died delivering air tanks. But Carolyn, you were wanting to talk about the various nasty diseases the boys were at risk of contracting in that cave. And fortunately, I think they all in pretty good health considering there weren't any major issues that I'm aware of. Uh, but there were some potentially risky things they could have gotten, aren't there? Yeah, because I guess following the story... Once they came out of the cave, you're kind of feeling like you know, they're out of the water you know, and that everything's going on. But then I was surprised to hear that a couple of days later, their parents hadn't even been allowed to go visit them. And mm. then even when they were allowed in to see them, they were only allowed to see them in through the glass at first. And then the next day they had go into the room, but um, only in hazmat suits. So, wow. I don't know, this seems like um, quite serious precautions. While at the same time, they were saying that the boys were mostly healthy and they, you know, they hadn't mm. detected any diseases uh, yet. I think one had slightly low blood pressure, I think, but that was all the really... Yeah, but you hope he isn't too infectious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that we wouldn't be too much of a risk to their parents. So, you know, mm. I mean, the whole thing must have been exceptionally rough on the boys and their parents, but, you know, that last little bit as well, it's when you feel like you're going to get to, you know, be with them, but they had to stay away yeah. still. Yeah. So there's quite a few things that we're actually worried about the boys having. So one of the big ones is um, catching cave disease, uh, which I guess you could catch down a cave. That sounds like a good place to get it. <laughs> <laughs> sounds very aptly named as well. <laughs> <laughs> and in caves, they tend to be very damp and they've got a limited air supply and there can be lots of bat guano, um, so there's particular nutrients there all of which adds up to a being really great location for fungi to grow. And ah, so okay. this is a fungal disease. And I think one of the reasons that they were taking all these precautions is that it can actually kind of hide in the immune system, behind the immune system for a while. So it could be quite mild or it might take a long time to show symptoms. So they were really taking um, particular precautions to check for this one. Although they might not even be out of the woods once they leave the hospital, as it can take. Yeah, I, I guess it's probably less infectious once they're out of the hospitals and all that, but uh, if you've got it growing in your lungs or something, you're probably talking about antifungals that are going to take quite a while to actually treat and all that because fungus is, uh, by definition, always very difficult to uh, clear up quickly. It's not like antibiotics, you know, two weeks, they'll be gone. Antifungals tend to be several more weeks after that. The cells are more similar to human cells and bacteria. Are. So it's less, it's harder to come up with a drug that targets them specifically that won't also damage your own cells. So won't you... It's one of those sort of statistics that I hear, um, you know, how we share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees or something, but there's something like 60% of our DNA is in common with fungi. Does is that sound right? And is that one of those sayings that annoys geneticists? <laughs> I guess it's a question of kind of what does it mean in some ways, because they have a lot smaller genome than we do. Um, but we definitely have a lot more in common with the fungi than we do with the bacteria. Okay. Really? Interesting. But I th that's why I find evolution in genetics so bizarre, is that you get things like whales have more in common with cows than any other sea uh, creatures and things like that. It's that general gist of things that you would think are going to be 
similar in terms of the genetics, but they're actually... Yeah, I suppose, you know, it's convergent function. Mm. So they can, you know, live under the water, but because they're mammals like cows, they share a lot of the same functions with them. So their immune system will be more similar to a cow immune system than a fish. Right. And the way yeah. they circulate their blood and breathe. So, yeah, that's why I just find a lot of evolution and genetics to be mind-blowing in that things are not always as they seem. But, okay, so cave fever. So this is a fungus infection that they can get just by being in a cave that has mold and uh, fungus growing. Uh, yeah, I don't think they've found they've had any of these, so that's good. Hmm. And we're also worried they might get melodosis, another great name. This is um, a bacteria that lives in wet soil. It can also be fatal. Another bacterial disease, leptospirosis, that spread through bat urine um, is also associated with flood water. And since that they, this problem started with the flood water, I guess that must have been a real concern. And also where they might get bat rabies, from lysivirus, which is lysivirus. It's one we also have here in Australia. So mostly you need to be bitten to get this one. But people have also mm -hmm. been worried you might be able to transmit it through bat one. Or bats. Or We're going to come back to that in a bit. But bats seem to be a common theme in uh, all of these diseases. But we'll come back to that later on, I think. The, uh, another risk that I read about was that because they were starving and they didn't have a fresh supply of water, that there was that people can lick water off the cave walls or something, and that is likely to have all sorts of bacteria in it as well. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't be just drinking the actual water Well, I'd actually flood the other way around, itself. that the stuff that came off the cave wall um, might be safer as it's filtered through the rocks. Whereas the stuff that's mm -hmm. at the bottom of the cave, that's the floodwaters. Um, so it could be bringing things in. Right, okay. But I'm not sure maybe there are two separate, you know, things you could get <laughs> from each kind. Mm. It's a tip in case you ever find yourself in your modern life in a cave. Um, <laughs> lick the walls. Don't drink the floodwater. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like all of the tips that I picked up when I was when I was a kid on how to survive um, quicksand problems, which I really thought were going to be a bigger <laughs> issue in life than they did become, as it turned out. Yeah, yeah. Well, you haven't done all that much adventuring in uh, it's true. quicksand it's places. True. I saw a, um, a sign from one of the, a Thai school where they said, places you might need your English, you know, how long have you been down here? <laughs> you know, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing about turtles or libraries or apples. <laughs> <laughs> um. Any other major diseases that they're at uh, risk of? No, I think that was there? kind of covering what they could have got. They're the main ones. Uh, the main so ones. Nasty bacterial and bat-related things and funguses. There's also just the whole lack of oxygen and uh, all that sort of thing because I kept thinking, you know, they're in this cave. Caves have access to air. Air's flowing in. But, of course, that whole flooding thing blocked off huge tunnels and parts of the cave. So that was low oxygen, low light, you know, they're in the dark the whole time and that means your vitamin D levels suffer and your uh, whole circadian rhythm. So, like, they didn't know how long they'd been under there. They're like, what day is it and stuff? Yeah, you'd have no idea. And also the carbon dioxide was going up because I had nowhere to vent. And also the whole sanitation issue. Like there's nowhere to go to the toilet apart from this little stretch of dirt that they're sitting on. So there's all sorts of things that could be cross-contamination from then and also obviously there's the starvation aspect there's nothing to eat and i thought it was interesting i was reading somewhere that the first three days or so they were obviously really hungry and starving and they were having this massive famine uh, response that the body generates after like the fourth day and onwards they didn't feel a hunger that much and that's just the body adapts and now i think that's really that's incredible that the body's like well all right I'm going to shut things down and work out a way that you're not going to feel ravenous when there's no food around as a survival mechanism. They probably also had some effects of the exercise of riding their bikes there and then going through the cave system too, because there would have been, you know, some that, you know, their exercise involved in doing that. Plus they were all a soccer team, right? So, mm. um, they, you know, then they're suddenly sedentary for days and days and days and days, just sitting in one spot doing nothing other than licking walls or not licking walls or whatever. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? They're not really burning many calories just other than... True. Was it cold? Do we know what the temperature was in there? I kind of heard that it was know. in the 20s. Oh, okay. It's pretty when you're comfy. underground, I guess it's relatively insulated. Mm. So the temperature, I guess it's very steady. 
and it wasn't too. So they're not really burning all that many calories then, I guess. So that that would help. I'm not saying I'm not disagreeing with you. It's were, awesome that the body does it. Yeah. Yeah, and their coach was kind of telling them to make sure they stay still and conserve their energy. So right. It's instrumental in getting them through. Yeah. It definitely sounds like it. Sounds like he kept his cool. I think the whole thing is just an extraordinary tale. It's amazing that they were all okay at the end. Amazing that none of these diseases affected them, that they were able to survive for that long is just incredible. And uh, yeah, tragic loss of the Navy SEAL who was uh, part of the rescue operation. Just one of those stories that makes you just go, wow, what an amazing thing to happen. So many amazing people who helped out on the rescue. Definitely. But let's circle back because you, you were talking about the back guano, the bites from bats. I've often wondered why it's often bats that seem to get blamed for viruses that spread to humans. I mean, there's outbreaks of Ebola. I think SARS and Hendra virus have been blamed on bats. And of course, rabies that you mentioned. I don't know how accurate or not it is that uh, bats are always blamed for it. But it... It's just that bats are creepy. <laughs> well, some of them are kind of I mean, cute. They fly around and worry they're going to get tangled in your hair. I think you've just seen too many uh, vampire movies maybe. But, but no, is that an accurate uh, uh, thing that bats seem to be at the heart of a lot of viruses or is that a myth? Well, I think this has been an open question for a while that researchers felt like there were a lot of um, viruses coming from bats, but no one had really studied this systematically. So last year, a group from EcoHealth Alliance New York, led by Peter Dezark, tried to be much more systematic about this by noting the number of species there were of different um, animals and then how many viruses were associated with them and then how many vi of those viruses um, were zoonoses, so viruses that can be in the animal population and then can also infect humans mm -hmm. um, and then tr tried to track those. And they found that the number of um, those cross-infectious um, diseases, viruses that can go into human, were predicted by how related the species was uh, to humans, what the host taxonomy is like, and then how closely humans live with the species. And what they found, okay. yeah, was that it did actually have a significantly propor higher proportion of, or predicted to have a significantly higher proportion of these kind of diseases than other creatures. Uh, creatures. I knew it. Yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, rats also have a bad um, rap. That's so true. I would also kind of feel that, you know, that they were. They estimated that there were 17 zoonoses yet to be discovered for every bat species compared to 10 for each rodent. I mean, both of which sounds pretty bad, um, but... <laughs> so none of these sound like yeah. things I want to catch. But that's the important, uh, an important thing to note, of course, is that there are so many species of bats. We tend to think of bats as being just like the vampire bat or one particular sort of thing, but it's everything from fruit uh, bats to little micro bats that are the size of a golf ball or smaller sort of thing. There's a huge range of bats, and we've talked about them before, that it's this variety, it exists, this diversity. Yeah, so like I wonder in Melbourne, if some are more. that are most visible. And so yeah. I kind of forget there are all these other species. We had some moved yeah. into our courtyard, um, or at least come visit our courtyard each night last year. Oh. They've got some palm trees there that fruited. They would fly in mm -hmm. and take them. Um, I suppose it's <laughs> kind of fine, but then they would poo all around. And that did worry me about, you know, this back guano being everywhere. Yeah, well, now that you know all the diseases that can <laughs> be transmitted through that. Yeah, well, hey... Well, we got rid of the fruit and that we got rid of the bats. And so no more bats, no more bat puke. Uh, <laughs> but it is pretty magnificent to watch them you know, just fly past your window, though. Uh, so that's exactly mm -hmm. they've gone. Yeah, well, Melbourne does have a big bat problem uh, and has had for some time, particularly with the botanical gardens. They had a lot of trouble with them there. But uh, I wonder if there are any particular species of bats that are more... Um, I, what was the word zoonotic that are more likely yeah. to spread diseases uh, than other ones but I guess it, as you say it depends on you know how closely they live among human habitat and uh, among humans and things like that as well it's going to be a big impact yeah well they also I mean they have a very large viral load in bats so they were kind of so now they've decided they probably do have more of these viruses than other creatures they're looking into what is it that makes the bats so special and you know, so 
you know, such a great uh, reservoir for viruses. And they've had a lot of hypotheses and none of these have necessarily been proven yet. But they have a, a different immune system to other mammals, that, which has a shorter antibody half-life, which means they're not so effective at clearing viral infections. So they tend to be carrying more than other species at any one time. Wow. Um, okay. And so all- does that mean that most bats that we come across are sick, that they're infected with things that they haven't necessarily been able to cure because of their yeah, weaker I guess immune systems? Yeah, they it quite often at a quite a, I guess a low titer, so maybe it's not being too bad for them, but they can't clean it up totally. Wow. Um, they also roost in, you know, really big colonies. And you imagine, you know, the way you mm-hmm. see the nest right next to each other, it must be so easy for disease to spread um, within them. Yeah. They also get very hot when they fly. Um, this is kind of interesting. And so their temperature gets up to, say, 40 degrees as they are flapping around. And so the viruses that can actually survive in bats, they're quite tough viruses um, because mm-hmm. they can get up to 40 degrees. And so these are ones that can survive human fever which is a kind of technique to try that your body does to try and kick viruses right, out. Yes. So when we do get these viruses, oh, wow. um, this might be a reason why they're so terrible ones, like Lyssa virus or the Hendra virus or Ebola. You know, all these are really serious viruses, which we have a lot of trouble clearing. So should we be afraid of bats then? Is this something that we need to cull them, we need to eradicate them? Because we've also talked on the show before that they are really important pollinators, um, possibly even, you know, more so than bees in, and insect control, where they will eat a lot of the little bugs and insects that would otherwise be a problem. So does this mean that bats are a big problem or are we living in harmony more or less with them? I think you just wouldn't want to be having them share your house. So, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think having a bat living in your house is a great idea, but if they're just out about doing you know going about their business that's probably okay Hmm. but some of the diseases we're seeing at the moment they're coming from in tropical areas where they're um, clearing rainforests and so they're getting rid of some bat habitat and so that's nowhere else to go but kind of move into human houses and so this is why some of these are emerging at the moment Um, yeah so i suppose it is about trying to live in harmony so they've got their own space and we've got our own space yeah all right let's move on And in yet another case of scientists looking for one thing and finding something else, astronomers have accidentally discovered 12 new moons around Jupiter. Lucas, this puts the total number of moons that we know of around the giant planet to 79. That's pretty cool. It is. I like that. I mean, it's kind of cool to say, oh, I accidentally discovered a moon. You know, it's like, oh, that's a good story. Accidentally discovered... 12 moons. It just sounds so unlikely, doesn't it? It's like, what were you doing mm-hmm. that day? Well, in this case, these guys <laughs> were actually hunting for Planet 9 or Planet X, or it goes by various names, the, the theorized planet that, that may be, you know, way, way out in the solar system and perturbing the orbits of, of Kuiper Belt objects. So it's something that we talked about on the show before. So this, this particular team were, were looking for that, and they, they're using a, a, a particularly cool piece of kit, which is the, the Blanco 4-meter telescope, which is in, in Chile. And this, this telescope has got a, a camera attached to it that's um, basically the largest, uh, largest camera ever built. And its its purpose in in terms of equipment is to find uh, really faint things that are moving against the background of stars. So we've talked about various methods for for spotting planets before, and we've talked about how many of the Kuiper Belt objects and a lot of the asteroids have been found. Even basically all the planets uh, were found the same way, where way back in the day they just used photographic plates uh, of a series of, of photos that have been taken one after the other in sequence to see okay, what is actually moving against the background of stars? Because that is more than likely to be something that, that's sharing, your, you know, that's in orbit around the sun. Um, so in this case, that's, yeah, they're using this to try and find planet X, planet 9, planet whatever we're calling it. Um, and instead, they uh, they happened to cross a whole lot of moons. Now, this camera also has a really wide field of view. So something you've got to know about Jupiter is that because it's so massive, it has a really quite a, a you know a, a fairly large influence on its on its local area so it can hold on to moons that are much much further out than than other smaller bodies like earth can 
So if you think of, if you've ever looked at Jupiter through a telescope, you typically would, unless you're quite unlucky, you'd, you'd typically see at least three of the um, Galilean moons. So they're, they're quite obvious when you're looking through a telescope because they're reflective enough. And sometimes you can even catch Io sort of crossing over and you see its shadow, which is really cool. But they're really, really close into Jupiter when you look at it through a telescope. These things are much, much further out. So you wouldn't really capture them in, your, in a telescope that's looking you know, at, at Jupiter, a ground-based telescope. Mm. But this camera also has another really nifty feature, which is they can use this blocking approach in it that it can sort of block out the, the light coming from Jupiter itself because Jupiter is really bright. Um, so it's normally second only to Venus in the sky. At the moment, it's, sec- it's third because it's behind Mars, which is really, really bright yes. right now. Go look at Mars. Um, right now is a great time to look at planets in the sky. It is terrific. Really, really cool time. Uh, I think, in fact, coming up about the 26th of July, I'm not sure when this show will go out, but it's meant to be stunning because um, you'll you'll have basically Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, and Mercury, and Mars all mm. Uh, visible at once which is a yeah. rare oh that's cool yeah and and really really bright so mars is just ultra ultra bright right now it's um it's it's yeah. brighter than jupiter yeah. so anyway it's jupiter's bright and the camera can block it and that's really good because then you can see dim things that are nearby and what they basically found was these 12 moons were, were orbiting so uh, they've gone okay that's pretty cool now in terms of moons uh and and their, their orbits they worked out that um a whole host of these moons are actually in a retrograde orbit so there's i think it was eight Hang on, i'm just scrolling 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 i thought it was just one or two nine nine of them are in retrograde orbit Oh, wow. So they're in, a, in quite a wide retrograde orbit. Um, so that, that in retrograde means they basically go in the opposite direction to the direction of the planet spin. So usually that indicates that they're either captured bodies or they've been perturbed in their orbit quite severely. Because if they formed with the planet, they would tend to rotate in the same direction as the planet. And if you say, for example, look at the Earth-Moon system, this is a part of the reason or part of the pieces of evidence that stack up to show that although the Moon probably formed from an impactor, it still probably contains a lot of material from Earth. Um, So, yeah. And plus, we've we've backed that up by going there and getting stuff. Yes, we've been there. So, well, not me. It <laughs> wasn't actually, wasn't me personally. So, yeah, nine of them are in this retrograde orbit. But two of the ones that they've found are actually in um, a prograde orbit, which is, so it's going the same direction as the spin. That's fine. That's great. But one of the moons, one of the moons that's in a in a in a in a retrograde orbit, uh, sorry, in, in one of the moons that's in a, a, a prograde orbit is is really weird. It's in quite an uh, quite an eccentric orbit that actually crosses the path of the retrograde moons. So this team are actually right now trying to work out how long it's likely to be until this little moon. I'm not quite sure. Valtudo or Val Valitudo. I'm not sure. Valitudo. 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 It was the Roman goddess of health and hygiene. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't be found in the back caves. <laughs> No, <laughs> <laughs> and if she was, she'd definitely be licking the walls, not the uh, not wow the waters. So yeah, Valetudo, because uh, uh, all the, the all of Jupiter's um, moons are, are named for Roman mythical um, identities that had something to do with with Jupiter. Anyway, um, so yeah, Valetudo, um it will crash. It's very very likely that it will crash into one of these. Um, other moons at some point in time and that the, the team are kind of extrapolating at the moment will be somewhere between about 100 million to a billion years so i feel like doing this <laughs> how can i say that um so so that in itself is interesting because it actually helps us to try and it helps us with the questions about um both planetary formation for jupiter because moons really give you a lot of information about the formation of planets because your system your model to explain how a planet form has to account for its moons. Now, as I said, some of those moons are going to be captured, and particularly with Jupiter, it's really, really massive, so um, it can capture things, and and actually it's been really good for us in a lot of ways because it's probably captured a lot of things that otherwise might have come into the inner orbits and been a problem for us. But your model needs to account for all of the things that it didn't capture that, that form with it. Now, we know, so the number's now at 79, although two of the moons are not yet confirmed. Um, the other ones are. So it's around 79. It's likely there are hundreds. I mean, it's, it's very, very likely there are hundreds because they're so faint and so far out um, that, you know, 
it's uh, just think of Earth. We we know, for example, there's there's likely some Trojan moons as well. So um, these are ones that are sitting in two of the Lagrange points that are either in front of or behind the Earth, um, but they don't they don't orbit the Earth as such in the typical way that our moon does. Um, so yeah, Jupiter's going to have a lot of a lot of extra moons that we haven't seen. There's no doubt about that. But the more you find, obviously, the the, the more evidence you have and the more information you have to try and extrapolate out and figure out how did the system uh, actually form. So this Velocudo, it looks like the fact that it's on this weird orbit means that it may actually be the remnants of one or two moons that they reckon might have actually caused all of these weird retrograde orbit moons, which are, share a similar orbit to each other. Because that kind of indicates that maybe they they basically are pieces of something. So it's, it's possible the Velocudo... I they found it, that there should be a moon that's on that orbit like Velocudo? Uh, not that I read. I didn't read anything about a particular orbital path that, that it should be on, but that's quite possible. It just might not have been covered in, in what I read. It uh, wouldn't surprise me. I mean, they've been they've been tossing around um, ways to explain a lot of Jupiter's moons for for a long time, and and the leading theory was that there was probably an impactor. But uh, but now this Velocudo indicates that perhaps this might actually have been uh, maybe one of two impactors that that caused this group of moons. So in terms of body of evidence, it's really cool. We know more stuff. I just again, I love the fact that you can accidentally discover 12 moons that's just awesome um and and as you said at the beginning you know it's really yet another case of you don't know you don't know what the what you're going to find until you look you know and there's there's so many things across all disciplines of science that if we if we only focused on investing in stuff that we knew what the payday would be we actually know what the outcome is going to be before we start then there's so many things that would never be discovered and we don't know what we can use these discoveries for. Um, in this case, it helps us figure out how, you know, this system worked, and that that it has an extension of figuring out how other systems might work. I mean, it, it all adds to our body of knowledge. So, really, really cool. But also in this case, knowing how many moons there are in the solar system and where they are makes it a lot less risky that you're going to send a billion dollar probe to a planet and have it crash into a moon and obliterate. Yeah, that's if we true. know that where everything yeah. is. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I mean, when I first read it, yeah. When I first read the story, you know, uh, we found twelve new moons around Jupiter. I thought, okay, so it was probably the Juno probe that we've got orbiting Jupiter right now. That must have found them or something. But of course, it's not looking for moons. It's looking no. at Jupiter and studying Jupiter. And even so though it's on is, a really, a really protracted, elongated orbit itself, yeah. it's nowhere yeah. near out as far as these moons are apparently. So, and it can't. It's not looking in the right direction, as you said, to even see them. So now so, it's got inside yeah. safe from those ones. Yeah, safe from those. But there are other moons that maybe we haven't found yet that it's going to find for us by being hit by them. It probably won't happen. Don't worry. Don't panic. Bear in mind, I mean, the, the, the chances of anything hitting anything nowadays in our solar system is exceptionally rare because space is mm. really big. And even if it you've got big. something like Jupiter, I mean, Jupiter itself is freaking huge. So that's the <laughs> technical term. Yeah. yeah, it's not, it's not, there's not likely to be all that many collisions with probes and moons anytime soon, even if we don't know we're there, but hey, it could happen. It's certainly better than a note. Mm. Yeah. I think space yeah. junk's probably a bigger problem for us right now. In, in that sooner or later we're going to have trouble getting stuff out of our own orbit yeah that's true but that's an entirely different story and that's a mo lot more complicated problem yeah so we might talk about it another time well let's move on to our last story and uh scientists at the edith cohen university in western australia have developed a blood test which in a recent trial was successful in detecting melanomas in 81.5 percent of cases that's a really promising result because melanoma is one of those cancers where early detection can have a huge impact on uh, treatment and survival. Uh, Lucas, this is pretty promising early results. Hugely promising. I mean, as you say, the, the um, detection rate is really, really high. So it's been trialed on 124 patients so far. And apparently the, the test, uh, I, where did you get the 80 something percent figure from? I didn't uh, that. It's in a oh, BBC sorry, uh, oh, it's article. A different one. It says, okay. in a trial involving about 200 people, half of whom had the cancer, the test was successful in 81.5%. So I think half of them had the cancer. That's the 120 people that you might have been talking about. 
Ah, right. Okay. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. So it's a matter of, yeah, that's that's always fun, isn't it? Dealing with yes, percentages like pretty versus good, counts. Pretty good sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess with that, you're going to get a bunch of false positives through as well. But then you can move on to the next stage of trying to weed right. those ones out as well. Yeah. yeah, they are planning to undergo more clinical trials to take place in the next three years, uh, and they're looking to improve its accuracy to 90%. I don't know why that's the particular gold standard, but that's well, their aim. But sorry, Lucas, uh, you were... Yeah, we no, that, that's, no, that's that's fine. Uh, I mean, there's, there's not a, a huge amount to say about it other than that that's really cool because <laughs> currently the, the way that melanoma is, is, is generally detected is, is, is you go to your doctor and go... And either you say, this looks wrong, this has changed, and then they biopsy it and send it off to have it have it looked at under a, a microscope and they come back and tell you whether they need to do more stuff. Or you, you your doctor finds it if they're doing a routine check. Now, I must admit, I've never had one of those air quote routine checks at all in my whole life. <laughs> I should do that. Um, you should. Yeah, I really should do that. Um, but uh, yeah, so now this this test actually works by apparently detects combinations of protein antibodies, mm -hmm. which your own body produces in response to melanoma. So it means that you can potentially find it a lot easier, a lot a lot e earlier, I should say, um, than than the traditional thing. Which realistically, it kind of you know at the moment we wait until it's basically becoming symptomatic. We're, we're waiting until you can actually visually see something wrong or maybe, you know, maybe you're at the point that there's pain. But the thing is, melanoma is so freaking dangerous because if it's, it can so easily travel around the body and, and Im impact on other parts of the body. So it's, um, it's a really, it's a really important one to, to jump on. And of course, you know, we've all grown up in that period of the slip, slop, slap, and now hmm. there's several other things you meant to do, I think. Slide, sunglasses and... That's it. What's the other one? Slide your sunglasses on and I think just stay inside. <laughs> <laughs> just stay inside. Yeah. It just rolls off the top. Find, now, a <laughs> find the nearest <laughs> cave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is really interesting because it finds – it's you using your immune system um, and it's constantly surveilling your body um, to see what's going on. And so your body creates antibodies, autoantibodies against um, the melanomas. And that's what they're looking for, these antibodies that can detect particular proteins that only show up if you have particular proteins produced by the melanomas. And so they had a kind of a panel they tested and they found, I think, 29 of them. If you've got if this combination of 29 of them, um, would give them the best results of telling you that melanoma was there. Which is so cool. And I love it because it's like the body hacking sort of thing that there's so much clickbait stuff for all the time on the internet it's like do this one thing to uh you know to to slash your chances of melanoma <laughs> well this is um this is kind of one of those things that you know have this one test which uh, people are going to love but i think um um as you were saying the was it 29 how many did they test it was quite a lot that they tested uh 1627 different types of antibodies that they mm -hmm. tested um yeah. to identify yeah. a combination of 10 that best indicated the presence of melanoma. So, yeah, and this was in patients, uh, confirmed patients relative to healthy volunteers. So, yeah, it's really, really cool. And Australian research too, which is so nice. Exactly, and especially since uh, in Australia we have the highest incident rates of melanoma uh, and about 1,500 people in Australia die from melanoma each year. And about 14,000 cases are diagnosed every year. Yeah, there's a quote from uh, Professor Mel Zyman, uh, who I think led the study. Uh, she says, if we can remove the melanoma when it is less than one millimetre thick, you have a 98 to 99% chance of survival. So, obviously, is, if you can get it early, you're pretty good. But, uh, but if it's, uh, that, that survival rate decreases to less than 50% if the cancer spreads in the body. So, uh, yeah, real, early detection, really, really important. Yeah, you should go get so, that skin checked. <laughs> yeah. Get your skin checked. Do your regular checkups, people. We should oh. all be getting regular yearly checkups. I think it's just too, uh, too important not to. All right. I think that's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 304. Don't forget, you can help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate, pledging to support us on Patreon, or just spread the word. Tell people to listen to us. 
grab their phones when they're not paying attention and subscribe for them. Turn your car radio up super loud, put the windows down and blast it out at everyone. Get the word out there. Dr. Carolyn DeGraff, it is always great to have you on the show. Always a pleasure. And of course, thank you, Lucas. Thanks, Ed. And a big thank you to everyone listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. What's the creepiest thing you've encountered while on the job? I had to clean up a gallon-sized ball of urine mixed with acid. Essentially, the sulfuric acid that is mixed with the urine basically keeps the uh, toilet from, from clogging up, if you could imagine something like Drano. Drano.